A couple of things right off the bat. Um, Father, would it be at all possible to bright, brighten the lights? Yeah. You guys will go to sleep. I just know it. I can tell. <laughs> there's something, I don't know, there's something about having the lights kind of dim. Unless there's a huge spotlight or something, everybody will just go to sleep. And I don't want that. Um, if you do need to go to sleep, though, like I tell everybody always, if you know, you know when you're fighting sleep, that, that wretched feeling that you have, and you have some form of Bell's palsy going on, and, and I just want to say, if you're that tired, I, I'm, I'm, I mean it, though, just go to sleep, because as hard as it is for you to fight sleep, it's twice as hard for me to watch your face. <laughs> I can see every one of you from the front. I can see all the eyes rolling back and the heads nodding, so I've, I've told that to teenagers, and they just lay down on the floor, and I'm fine with it. You go ahead and do that. Um, also, um, uh, Father had asked if I was comfortable giving a talk with the Blessed Sacrament exposed behind me. Um, and I am. I'm not as comfortable with having my back to Jesus. That's, that's awkward. But also, I, it helps me stay reverent um, in my content. So shouldn't be scandalized tonight at all. But we don't ever know for sure. Um, and then lastly... Uh, my kids and my family are with me tonight. Um, we drove down straight from International Falls and got here right at the last minute. My daughter is wandering around, and I'm a stay-at-home dad, and I was with my daughter all day. And, so, and my wife wasn't, so I was the one in charge. And when my wife got in the car straight from work, she was like, you, she's wearing that? And so she is in a summer dress and sandals, and I'm sorry, but my wife made me say that. So... So just so you know now, why, sh why would it's because of me. It's because I'm the dad. And that's, you know, God sent the kid along and knew I was the dad the whole time. So, like, there was always going to be some really poor wardrobe choices. Um, but, I, yeah, I'm very excited to be here tonight. I thank you guys for coming. Um, I'm, I'm glad we get to spend the weekend together. Um, so we, I probably saw on the poster that we entitled it um, How to Be a Missionary in Three Easy Steps. Uh, that's for a couple of reasons. One, you probably already know that, that me and my family were missionaries, and we are, uh, Lord willing, and the creek don't rise, and World War III doesn't break out. We are moving to Cambodia in September. Uh, September 5th, we would fly, Lord willing, um, which is really cool. The other day, I had a priest tell me that, uh, uh, that that's the day that John Paul II began speaking about theology of the body, so that's kind of fun. Um, but we, that's when we intend to fly away and hope hopefully stay there for, for quite a long time. So it's, it's a move. So uh, pray for us. Um, and so I was talking to Father, and at one point I had asked him, hey, could we ever just come by the church and just mention our missionary efforts a little bit and let people know what's going on? Because coming into the Catholic Church, uh, you kind of find that lay missionaries are few and far between. You don't hear about it very often. Um, growing up in our church that we grew up in in the assemblies, every third Sunday you'd have, you know, you'd have a missionary there just talking about whatever country they were from. And when you walked in, you always had pictures of the lay missionaries missionaries that, well, we didn't even call them lay missionaries because we didn't have priests, but the missionaries and what country they were in and their families, and there's pictures everywhere. And so we realized, I had asked him, could, could we come and just maybe make an announcement after all the masses? And he's like, well, let's do one better. Let's do all of Lent and folk, because that's how he does it. He just goes all in. I didn't even want to be around him that much, but that's what he wanted. Um, but so we get to focus on that. And then we realized, if you look in the catechism, the catechism is very clear. The church is very clear that every single Christian has a missionary calling. And not even that. The church itself, in order to be called Catholic, in order to be universal, has as its very nature mission. That, that the, the church itself, God's church on earth, has to be preached to all places, at all times, to all men. And that, that's missionary efforts. And so then we realized, wow, you could actually go really big on this. You wouldn't have to just talk about the Davidsons going to Cambodia. We could actually talk about well, what does that mean for you guys? What does the catechism, what does the church say? What did Jesus say for you guys right now in your life? And I have to, I actually haven't told many people this, but I used to be very, um, I didn't like it when I would hear people say, well, everybody's a missionary. You can be a missionary in your own town, you know, in your own neighborhood. I didn't like that because growing up, I mean, the traditional def the definition of a missionary is somebody who leaves their culture and goes somewhere else with the specific reason of spreading the gospel. They leave their home and their own culture and everything they know, and they go into the world, not just to go, not just to travel, not just because it's fun to be overseas, but in order to spread the gospel. And I used to kind of um, buck at it when people would be like, well, everybody's a missionary. And because I'd be like, no, no, everybody isn't a missionary. But I did realize this in talking with the bishop recently, that our culture has shifted so drastically, so quickly, 
that when Catholics walk out their door into their neighborhood, it is a fundamentally different culture. We hear about it all the time. We have a culture of death. We live as people of life in a culture of death. And so actually, I am wrong now. It isn't that anymore. If you walk out your door, you are a missionary. Because this culture not only just doesn't get us, it hates some of the teachings of our faith. And I mean, Jesus said that, you know, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. And so that shouldn't be a surprise. We shouldn't even hate it. We should be excited. Because we actually have a mission. We have a calling. And so when, we, when I titled the weekend that, you know, three easy, how to become a missionary in three easy steps, it was in order to get you guys on board to realize that you guys are all missionaries. And we happen to be called to go to the other side of the world and bring a few suitcases. But that's just our calling. Your calling is the same calling. Every single Christian has the same calling, that of being a missionary in this world. And that is exciting. And I realize, you know, when you go into Lent, every Catholic knows it. Every single time Lent happens, we have the three things. We have prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. Prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. Pray, and you know they're going to talk about it, and it's on all the rice bowls, and it's just the way it's going to be. And it can be really easy to kind of, like, let that fade and, like, just, oh, yeah, it's the same thing. It's, it's every year. They're just going to They're just going to reiterate. But the hope is to realize that if our call is to be a missionary, then it's, if we were called to do something, it wouldn't be something that's impossible for us. It would be something that God knows we're equipped to do. At every age of our life, in every demographic, no matter where you're at in your life, if you're living and breathing, you still have what it takes to be that missionary. And actually, it can be easily categorized by pray, fast, and give. So then this weekend, that's what we'll focus on. Tonight, we'll just talk about prayer. And prayer is tough as well, because if, if you've grown up Christian at all, you've, you've heard any number of um, guidances on what, or opinions on what prayer is. You have the people who like, no, you just have to meditate for hours and hours. This is what you have to do. It's the only way to pray, uh, which is terrible, because I don't know how to meditate. But then, uh, and so if you get the idea that prayer on one end is this very regimented thing, that it has to be, it has to look like a certain thing. Well, then that gets really tough because not all of us can do that specific thing, whatever it happens to be by the person who's talking to you. But then you have, on the other hand, you have people who will always love to quote Therese of Lisieux, that prayer is just a surge of the heart towards heaven. You hear that all the time. And that's true. Prayer is that, but you kind of get a spectrum there. You get people who would be like, ah, it's no big deal. It's just, uh, yeah, just uh, surge your heart once in a while and everything's good. And like, oh, I can do that, but that doesn't lead to anything. But then if you have the other end and you get boxed into it being one thing, it's pretty discouraging at well, as well. And then if, we, if we're honest, all of our lives are so chaotic. We're all so busy. And it's all good busy. If you have kids, it's insanity, but it's good. If you're a grandparent, you have insanity, but it's, well, you're just insane. Grandparents are insane. But beyond that, it's just, it, life gets so crazy that you can start to think, well, how am I supposed to pray? And then if you top it off that way, way, way on this end, you have Paul who's like, pray without ceasing. Don't ever quit praying. That can be utterly discouraging, because how am I supposed to do that? I can't meditate for five minutes. I can't even surge my heart for two minutes. I don't even know what that means. How am I supposed to pray without ceasing? And then every time Lent comes around, the church is like, don't forget to pray a bunch. You're like, I don't know how to do that. And so what I wanted to do tonight is just kind of dive into what our church teaches prayer is. Now, a couple of things. One, I'm going to quote from the catechism, all three of my talks. I'm going to quote heavily from the catechism. So if you have a catechism at home, I would beg you to bring it tomorrow. Um, they do have some. They'll have some. Or I think there's some laying around the church as well. We'll have, you can just grab. But either that or bring a pen and paper and write down these paragraph numbers. I'm begging you. I am begging you to get familiar with your catechism. It is insane. It is so gorgeous. It's the 2,000-year oral tradition of the church. It's everything Christianity has taught and believed for 2,000 years. It is, it is amazing. I always say if you tore the cover off and just said C.S. Lewis wrote it, every Protestant would love the catechism. Because it's amazing. It is filled with such, I mean, it just blows your mind every time you stop and read one paragraph. And so I don't think there's any better place to go than to rely on the catechism for what prayer is. And so if you have pens and papers, I'm going to say a bunch of paragraph numbers. And you don't, you, have to write the whole, you don't have to transcribe the whole paragraph. If you brought a catechism just without even knowing, that's a, you get points. You get heaven points, whatever those are. But uh, at least write stuff down. Or this is actually recorded. It's going live as well. So it'll be, you can write it down after the fact. But please, bring your catechism tomorrow. Bring an extra one for that friend that you're going to invite as well. 
because this is good. We, uh, so I don't know if you know the catechism. It's divided into four pillars, four legs that the table stands on. And the first one deals with the creed. And it just goes line by line, dissecting the creed for hundreds of paragraphs. And then it moves through the sacraments. And what sacramental life looks like in the church. And it goes through all the sacraments. And then it moves into the Ten Commandments. Uh, it used to be called morality. Now they call it life in Christ. If, if you believe the creed and you celebrate the sacraments, then, what, then this is what life looks like. It's morality. It's, it's a life in Christ. <coughs> but then the epitome, the pinnacle, after all of those things, the final quarter of the catechism is prayer. And it's beautiful. It is, it is gorgeous, some of the things that the church is telling us that you would have no clue, especially if you listen to what the world thinks the Catholic Church teaches about prayer. This is completely opposite. So I'll dive in. I'm just going to start uh, in se- uh, paragraph 2558. If you're writing it down, 2558. It begins, great is the mystery of faith, exclamation point. The church professes the mystery in the Apostles' Creed, celebrates it in the sacramental liturgy, so that the life of the faithful, that's life in Christ, may be conformed to Christ in the Holy Spirit, to the glory of God the Father. And then it says this. This mystery then, our mystery of faith, requires that the faithful, that's you, believe it, celebrate it, live it, and have a personal relationship with the living and true God. Now listen, I'm a convert. If you would ask me, who doesn't have a personal relationship with Lord Jesus Christ, I would have said the Catholics. Because it's, that's what I thought about the church. I would have thought that, no, no, not a personal relationship. I mean, they have stuff that they do. But they don't have a personal relationship with him. But here it is, at the beginning of the section on prayer, that you, you celebrate it, you, or you proclaim it, you celebrate it, you live it, and you have a personal relationship with the living God. And it says this, um, And a personal relationship with the living and true God, this relationship is prayer. Mic drop. What is prayer? A relationship with God. It isn't prayer methods. Those are all good things. It isn't technique. It isn't time frame. Prayer is a relationship with God. And relationships take on different forms. On any given day. You're, so if you're married, I'll just use spousal. If you're married, your relationship with your spouse takes on different forms on any given day. When my day begins, I begin as an alarm clock. Every single day of my, our marriage for 20 years, every single day, I have to wake my wife up. When the end comes, she will be late. She will sleep through it if I'm not there. <coughs> Now, and you may have heard me tell this before, but any time I get a chance to tell this, I tell this. This is all very true. When my wife, every single morning of our marriage for 20 years, when she's laying there asleep, I'll go in there in the dark, and I'll shake her shoulder, and I say, baby, it's time to get up. Every, so that's me. This is the same alarm clock every day. Baby, it's time to get up every day. Well, when she hit med school, she got to a level of tired she had never experienced before. And she started to say things that made no sense. And I started to write them down. I have a document, things Jacelyn said upon waking. And none of this is made up in any way whatsoever. The first time it happened, it was fine. It was not a big deal. I shook her shoulder. I was like, baby, it's time to get up. And she rolled over and says, thing is, uh, I'm a yogurt person, and we need more sleep. (laughs) And I was like, I can't argue with that logic. I'll come back. So I, went, I let her sleep longer. That makes sense. It happened a couple of days later. I was like, baby, it's time to get up. She rolled over and said, the thing about spatulas is you need them. And then she went back to sleep. But then it started to get weird. Not that that's not weird on its own. But uh, then one morning I was shook her and I was like, baby, it's time to get up. And she said, wait. You're going to get me a cardboard brontosaurus, and I'm going to ride it to the bathroom. <laughs> and then she went to sleep. But then one, once uh, I was about a year in, it got, she went full Vietnam on me. I shook her shoulder, and I said, baby, it's time to get up. And she said, no way in hell. <laughs> and I was like, honey, you got to go to school. And she's like, ain't happening, man. And then she rolled over and went to sleep. But. The scariest moment of my entire life happened one morning when, in the dark, I walked in, and I shook her shoulder, and I said, baby, it's time to get up. And she rolled over and looked into my soul, and she said, 
all hatred will be spread through you. <laughs> and then she went back to sleep. And no lie, the hairs on my head stood up, and I put my hands up, and I walked out backwards because there's no way I'm turning my back on her. <laughs> I felt like an oracle had just spoken a prophecy <laughs> over me. But anyway, I start my days like that every day. I don't know what's coming at me. I don't know if she'll have a gun. I have no clue. But I start the day as an alarm clock. And that is part of our relationship. I start the day waking her up. I wake up all the kids, except for Davey. Davey's up. I don't know if he ever sleeps. Um, I'm also a dishwasher. That's fine. That's cool. That's part of, I, I, I'm the stay-at-home dad. She's the professional. She has a job. I'm unemployed. So I stay at home, and I clean the house. And that's part of my relationship. Does that look like, like the other parts? No, but that's part of it. Um, I, I am a taskmaster to my children. I am a friend to my wife. I get to be her friend. I get to be a confidant. We, we handle life together. We're married. We have physical intimacy. We have all range. Sometimes we just get to sit and watch a movie together. There's no talking. There's no anything. Ever, we've sedated the children, and we just get to watch a movie. That is a part of our relationship. And so in one day, our relationship can look like all of those things. And what the church wants you to know right off the bat, when we enter into Lent and pr we're supposed to pray more, prayer is your relationship with God. And when we're told to pray without ceasing, that's entirely possible because it's your relationship with God. If you are in a relationship with him, it can be a prayer. That should be utterly encouraging to us. Because then it's not. You're not locked into a method. You're not locked into any one thing. Because in any given day, your relationship with God takes different forms. And that, when I read that, that was utterly refreshing to me. Because I'm not, I'm not a disciplined person. I have a short attention span. I don't know how to do certain aspects of prayer. But I can do all of those things. And that can be prayer. Um, and again, like if you like silent retreats, like this weekend, if you're coming here to be really silent, that's great, good. I like silent retreats just fine. I went on a silent retreat once a long time ago before I had kids. I went on a silent retreat, and it was great. It was so quiet, and that was awesome. Uh, and then now we have five kids, and there's just no quiet time anymore. Um, I used to have silent retreats. It was when I would have to use the restroom. Um, when, I, I, when we first got the kids, I realized if I have to go to the restroom, like, the long time, and I would sit down, then I had some silence. But now, something has changed, and, like, if I'm sitting down, but my pants are down, it's a beacon to my children. <laughs> and I don't know. I don't get it. I don't know how they know. I quietly sneak to the bathroom. But if I sit down, I, and it's not a lie, I have had three children with their, their chins on my knees. And I'm like, why do you want to be here right now? I don't even want to be here right now. So there's no silence. So when it comes to, like, silent introspection, it's not going to happen. But that doesn't mean I can't pray. Nothing means I can't pray. So what is prayer then? The catechism, and again, so we're going to start 2559. If you go into the catechism under 2559, they begin explaining, and they give us prayer as three things. Now listen, the entire section on prayer is, 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 is it's endless, and I had to glean, wean out so much stuff. I, I grabbed a few things in, in hopes of sparking your interest, especially in the catechism and in prayer. But these three things, this is what the, the section begins off on. It tells us prayer is three things. First of all, prayer is God's gift. Prayer is God's gift. It's great because the first line in that prayer, so it says, prayer as God's gift. And the first line says, prayer is the raising of one's mind and heart to God or the requesting of good things from God. That sentence makes it seem like it's all us. Okay, I have to raise my heart to God and, and I have to put my eyes to him and my mind and then I have to make requests. That seems like it's all us. But you have to remember, it's under the section, prayer as God's gift. And so it, it kind of teases us in. And we get to dive deeper. Um, because it goes on to say in that same paragraph, 2559, humility is the foundation of prayer. Only when we humbly acknowledge that we do not know how to pray as we ought are we ready to receive freely the gift of prayer. Man is a beggar before God. Brothers and sisters, only when you realize, I don't know how to pray, can you pray. And it's not like that fake, like, like fake pie, piety or whatever. It's like, so no, I actually don't know what to do. I, I don't know how to come to you, God. And God's like, good, you can't on your own. I've been waiting for this. 
I've been waiting for you to say that for so long. You're all on your knees and you're trying to do these things. I just want you to admit you don't know how to approach me because it's I who approaches you. That's it. I've just been waiting for you to give me the inroad. Let me approach. And that humility of saying, like, because that's straight from Scripture, we do not pray as, we do not know how to pray as we ought. And, and even, so, okay, I know how to, I know meditation is a prayer. I don't know how to do meditation. Contemplation, I don't, I don't know how. Vocal prayer, I get too distracted anyway. I don't know how to do any of that right. God, I don't know how to approach you right. And God is like, exactly. Man is a beggar before God. But that's not like a wretched, like saved a wretch like me beggar. That's like saying, no, in the, in the, in the relationship between us, we're always the one with our hands open and our eyes up. That's going to always be us. But that's always going to be us. I don't know. Do you, what, what do you want to do? And God is like, yes, now I want to answer. Now I want to pour myself out. So first and foremost, prayer is God's gift. I love this. And I had never thought of this until re- getting to read this. 2560. The wonder of prayer is revealed beside the well where we come seeking water. Has anybody watched The Chosen? Have you guys seen that show at all? If you get a chance, please do watch The Chosen. I'm not saying it's perfect, but it is wonderful. They do some things amazingly. And the scene where he meets the woman at the well, it's so, oh my goodness, it's so powerful. And I had never thought of this. You know, it's because Jesus approaches the well and he's like, hey, would, could I have a drink? And she gets in, they have this conversation about the living water. And the catechism, the church is telling us that the wonder of prayer is revealed beside the well. And they say, why? Because Jesus thirsts. It is he who first seeks us and asks us for a drink. I had never thought of that. Because we're like, oh, he's, he's God. He's there and he knows the truth and she needs him. But how does he start? He thirsts and he asks her. And that is the wonder of prayer revealed that he is thirsting for us. In fact, it says, whether, oh, sorry, Jesus thirsts. His asking arises from the depths of God's desire for us. Because we always feel like, well, I, don't, I don't yearn for God. I, I don't, my heart doesn't crave him. I hear speakers come and they talk about like desiring God. And I don't have that in me. And God's like, fine, it's not about you. I desire you. I crave you. I thirst for you. But then it says this, whether we realize it or not, prayer is the encounter of God's thirst with ours. God thirsts that we may thirst for him. God hungers that we hunger for him. Like anything that we start to feel for him in any moment, even this weekend, any moment where we're kneeling here and you get like those flashes of moments with God, you can, you can, it's almost tangible like Father was saying, those moments, they're all secondary. He's been feeling that infinitely for you since forever. He has longed to be with you since forever. That's it. So our prayer is a response to him just saying, hey, I thirst for you. I yearn for you. I desire you. And I desire you to desire me. Because you guys know that's what you're made for. You're not made to do anything for him. He didn't make humanity to, to march in step and to do his chores. He made humanity to be with him. To commune with him. To thirst for him. So the first, prayer is God's gift. So again, we're learning this weekend about prayer. Prayer is his gift to us. So no matter what form it takes, in any given day, throughout the day, doesn't matter. It's all from him anyway. Isn't that refreshing? Because you, you get to the end of the day. Have you ever gotten to the end of the day and be like, ah, oh, I wanted to, we've been trying to do novenas. Novenas are new to us because, I mean, I've been Catholic since 08, but it still feels like we're babies. And, like, I, we're, we're trying out novenas. We're trying them out. And they're cool. But, like, so we started novena five days ago, and we've prayed three times. <laughs> so we can't remember to do the novena in the mornings because that's when we want it. It's the only time we have. And so you would say, like, well, we're really bad at novenas. Well, we're really bad at remembering things. But we can't be bad at praying. Because, because it's from him anyway. The desire to remember to do the novena is from him anyway. And that's prayer. That's him relating to us. It's him speaking in our hearts. It's him tugging. That's all prayer. It's all relationship. So you can't do that poorly. So first, God is, uh, prayer is God's gift. The second, <clears throat> prayer is a covenant. The catechism says, where does prayer come from? Whether prayer is expressed in words or gestures, 
It is the whole man who prays. But in naming the source of prayer, Scripture speaks sometimes of the soul, like our soul prays, sometimes of the spirit, like our spirit prays, but most often of the heart, more than a thousand times. More than 1,000 times in Scripture, it, prayer is referred to as coming from the heart. According to Scripture, it is the heart that prays. Again, so you want to pray. Your, your heart wants to, but I just, I don't know, I'm busy. I got a lot of stuff going on. I don't know how. I'm not disciplined. Those are all secondary to your heart. If your heart is desiring, that is where prayer comes from. Prayer has already started. You're already praying in sorts. And it may not fit into the normal cliche, and it might not be the best. It might not be the most intimate. It might not be the most peaceful, but it comes from your heart. In fact, the catechism says, if our heart is far from God, the words of prayer are in vain. So you might be great at meditation. You might be great at contemplative prayer. You might be great at all the rosary. I've seen some old women before church burn through a rosary. Like a chainsaw blade, just, and we're out. Let's go. Coffee. You might be really good at praying. And it might come from your heart, but it might not. You might know some, oh, some of the old people are laughing. <laughs> like, yeah, I got a callus right there. <laughs> Sliding right through. But the thing is, you could also be very, you might struggle with discipline. And you might struggle with patience. And you might struggle for your brain to clear out in order to do meditative prayer. And maybe you're shy, so <coughs> vocal prayer is really rough for you. Maybe you feel like none of the traditional forms of prayer are for you. But you sure wish you could. Do you realize how much you're praying anyway? And all the discouragement is for nothing because you already have a relationship with him, so you have prayer. This is the beginning of the catechism on prayer. If our heart is far from God, the words of prayer are in vain. I've never been able to pray for long periods of time. I, I don't know if I've mentioned this before. I had a friend in college, a uh, guy in college named Ricky. I went to a Bible college, and on my floor, we had, we had just one long floor, and in the middle there was a prayer chapel, and you could go in and pray. Um, I heard. I guess I never went in. But Ricky, Ricky, you would see Ricky always bounced. He was just always hyper. He'd talk like this. And, um, and you kind of got sick watching Ricky talk because he was always, like, hey, guys, what are you doing? And he'd be like, I don't know. I want you to stop that forever. Um, but you would see Ricky in the afternoon, like 3 in the afternoon, just go bounding into the prayer chapel, and the door would slam behind him. And then you wouldn't see Ricky for like three hours. And then like three hours later, he'd come bounding out again, and he'd bounce up to you and be like, hey, guys, hey, what are you doing? And we, I was a freshman, and I'd be like, he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know, shaving a cat, <laughs> like uh, getting a 2.2 GPA. <laughs> what are you doing, Ricky? And Ricky would be like, oh, I was just praying. And at one point in my life, I got really frustrated that Ricky existed. He was really tough for me because, well, A, he had, his calves were so well-defined from all the, I'll never have calves like Ricky. But also, like, I remember thinking, I will never, ever go into a prayer room for three hours. I can't do it. And that can be discouraging. Unless you realize that your relationship with God is prayer. And that takes many forms even throughout one single day. Then everything changes. I'm glad Ricky was who he was. I'm glad. I just wish I hadn't spent so much time frustrated by him. And nauseous, motion sick. From it. The, the catechism says in 2563, the heart is the dwelling place where I am, where I live. According to the Semitic or biblical expression, the heart is the place to which I withdraw. The heart is our hidden center. Beyond the grasp of our reason and of others, only the Spirit of God can fathom the human heart and know it fully. It is the place of encounter. So again, beyond our reason, beyond anyone else, no one can get to the place where I dwell. Except for the Holy Spirit. And so it talks about prayer being a covenant. You guys know the difference. A contract is an exchange of goods. So I'll go to work for these many hours, and then you give me a paycheck. Or, or you give me money, I'll give you my car. It's an exchange of goods. But a covenant is an exchange of persons. When God makes a covenant with us, when you enter into a covenant marriage, you give yourself to the person and they give themselves back. When God would make a covenant, he would give his actual self. We know this. He gives his actual self. 
And so prayer, that relationship with him, isn't just a gift that he gives, but it's the gift of a covenant with him, where in that relationship he gives his actual self to us. Again, that doesn't have to look like one way or another. It is an exchange of persons. Prayer is a gift. Prayer is a covenant. And then it says prayer is communion. Prayer is communion. In the new covenant, this is 2565, if you're still writing things down. 2565. In the new covenant, listen to this. Prayer is the living relationship of the children of God with their Father, who is good beyond all measure, with his Son, Jesus Christ, and with the Holy Spirit. So again, defining. Prayer is what? If somebody asks you, what is prayer? Well, the rosary is a prayer. Um, the chapel of divine mercy is a prayer. I know the mass is a prayer. This, this is a prayer. I know that. But the church says, well, those are secondary. Those are methods of accessing your relationship with him because prayer is the living relationship of the children of God with their daddy. That's what prayer is. It is, it is the living relationship of you with your father and his son and his spirit. And then it gets crazy. And then it gets nuts. Because that sounds great. And then it says this. Thus, the life of prayer is the habit of being in the presence of the thrice holy God and in communion with him. And this is always possible. Holy cow. The life of prayer, the, the, what we're trying to study this weekend, is the habit of being in the presence of the thrice holy God and in communion with him. But if we think that's just coming to adoration, we can, we'll fail. If we think it's just a holy hour, we will fail. But that is not what this, the catechism is saying. The catechism is saying that the life of prayer is a habit of being in his presence. But it goes on to say, this is always possible because, and there's a because, through baptism, we've already been united with Christ. There is no moment of a baptized person's life when he is not with you. There is no moment in your life when he is not in you, through you, with you. There is no moment he is not with you. If you are baptized in him, you have been raised a new creature and you exist. You In him you live and move and have your being. So if you're washing dishes, you are in relationship with him and it is prayer. If you are at your job, which is drudgery, and you feel like it's just pushing you down all day, he is with you, and you are praying. There are blissful moments, and there are hard moments, and there are sad moments, and there are boring moments. The church calls them desolation, but they're boring. And all of those moments are prayer. The church is very definitively telling you it is always possible to pray. Does that mean we can't forsake God? No. Does that mean we can't make decisions that push him away? No. It's not saying everything you do is prayer. But it is saying it is always possible in every moment. I always laugh because my patron saint, before I ever, ever was open to Catholicism, I, I was leaving a uh, used bookstore. This was back in 2000, I think it was. I was leaving a, a used bookstore, and on the way out, on one of those spin racks, I saw this book, and it said, Dark Knight of the Soul. And no lie, I thought it was like a Batman thing because of Dark Knight. He was always known as the Dark Knight. That's what caught my eye. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. And it was 25 cents, so I grabbed it. And I went home, and I, I grabbed it and paid for it. Just I, <laughs> well, It's cheap. I can steal it. I grabbed it. I brought it home, and I read it, and it, it, it slayed me. It, it impacted my brain. So I was like, who is this man? Who is this John guy? And as, I, you know, as we were becoming Catholic, I chose him as my patron saint. One of the things that I loved about this guy is that you know, his fellow priests, his fellow brothers, they hated him for the reform he wanted to do. They beat him up and they kept him in a stone closet for nine months through the winter where it wasn't big enough for him to even stretch out straight. He couldn't lay down straight. And when they would come to bring him food, he would be on his knees with a smile on his face praying the Our Father. And I remember, I wanted him as my patron saint, not that I could ever, because if I miss one meal, I'm a jerk. And uh, if I have to kneel for more than two minutes, I'm a jerk. But just that idea that, like, this guy knew. 
what life was. He knew what relationship was. He knew how to pray because he was in relationship in a stone closet, freezing cold, hungry. He was in relationship with his beloved. Because it is always possible. That should be utterly discouraged or encouraging to us. And, you know, the church gives us these three. The catechism says that there are three uh, formal expressions of prayer, and I've mentioned them already. There's vocal prayer. So anytime we're together, we're praying vocally. When you're at Mass and you have a response, when you pray um, the Our Father out loud, when you pray the Rosary, those are all vocal prayer. That is a form of prayer. It's expressive. And so when, when you, you feel that within you and you say it, or even if you're at Mass and you don't feel it and you, you vocally pray, that's a form of prayer. It's a form of acknowledging your relationship with God. There's meditative prayer. Meditative prayer is when you engage your, your intellect, where you meditate on a passage or a holy writing, and then you think about it and try to delve into the depths. And you allow God to lead you, but you're engaging your intellect. And that is a form of prayer. It's a, I mean, it's, it's times like when I find myself thinking about my wife and I's relationship, and just like how much I love it, and how far, like, thank God that we've come in our lives. Like, I meditate on it. That's like, that's what we do with God. We can meditate on his word. And we engage our intellect in order to live rightly and to, to seek him more. And then there's contemplative prayer. Contemplative prayer is when you, you, in a certain sense, just say, I'm not going to think. I just, I want to take my heart and just be with you. I just, I just want to be with you. You guide my heart and emotions however you want to. It's utterly passive. It's what we usually do in adoration. At least when we begin, we come, we sit down, we don't say anything. I remember the first time I ever went to adoration. It was at St. John's Church in Duluth. Um, we were not Catholic. It was like the second Catholic thing we'd ever gone to. Father Mike was brave. Father Mike knew you should take these Protestants right to adoration. But he didn't explain anything. So we got to adoration. And I remember we got in and we knelt down. And uh, or we're, we're sitting. And then this bell rings and oh, everybody kneels. So then we kneel. And then nothing happens. For an hour. <laughs> and then after an hour, they ring a bell, and everybody gets up and goes home. And I remember, like, 15 minutes in being like, are they late? Like, is the band coming? Or, like, are we going to say, we're just, okay, we're going to stay. We're going to stay on our knees, too. We're not getting, not sitting down. And I remember thinking, like, what is this? Like, I, I was not good at contemplation. And, in fact, when we were leaving, I still remember the door. There was, this, well, like, that exit. We were going to walk out that side. It got over. Everybody was like, peace, blessings, go. And so we left. And on our way out, I was totally prepared. When we walked out the door, I was turning to my wife to be like, what the heck was that? And we stepped out the door, and I turned. And before I could say anything, she turned to me and she said, wasn't that amazing? And I was like, what the heck are you talking about? <laughs> Nothing happened at all. But at that point, my wife started to go to adoration, to holy hour at the Newman Center every morning. And we would get up, and I'd go with her. We'd, we'd pull up to Father Mike's. We'd walk in. I'd be like, I love you. She'd go into adoration. I'd go sleep on Father Mike's couch for an hour. Because I didn't, I didn't get adoration. I didn't get the Eucharist. I didn't get any of that. I knew if I was in there, I'd snore, and people would hear me. So I would just sleep. But my wife, somehow, Christ had reached through, and, and she was able to just be in con contemplation with him, just have her heart be with him. And that's a form of it, but it was a form I couldn't do. Was I praying on the couch? No, that wasn't prayer. That was just me sleeping. I gotta, I'm not trying to say that I was in the right. I was wrong on that one. But in all of these, again, this is our communion with him, and they don't have to look the same. For, so, for what was great for my wife didn't hit me. And that's fine. Me finding out that I can be washing the dishes, and that is prayer. Me finding out that even when I'm cranky, I can be in prayer. You have a spouse. I know you've never been cranky, but your spouse gets cranky, right? I know you don't. Some of you are mad at me because you're so cranky right now. But are you still their spouse? Are you still in relationship when you guys are irritable? Yeah. Is there any moment where you're not? No, you're still in relationship. And with God, it's infinitely more so. Then you're in, you're in relationship, and that is prayer of one kind or another. But what matters is I like to think of it as the orientation and the intent. What is the or orientation of your life and the intent? So when you get up in the morning, like so when we're driving down here, if I'm driving from here to, or from uh, International Falls down to here, I, I'm, driving, I'm driving towards Virginia. At some points, I have to slow down. It's 30 miles an hour. Some points, it's 45 miles an hour. Sometimes it's 55. Uh, real close to Virginia, it's 65. At any point, 
Those are different speeds. They look different. They feel different. But it's still, I, my orientation is to getting here. And in the same way, if you make the orientation of your life him, there's nothing that can't be prayer. All bets are off at that point. It's a wide open race. Because every single thing, if it's oriented towards him, at least if you're trying, again, so it's the orientation and the intent. If your intent is to get up and to lead this life for him, to live this life following him, if that is your intent, you're already starting your prayer. You're already starting with, that's why I do, when I, when I get up in the morning, I like to swing my legs over the edge of the bed, and then I just, I just do this. <sighs> like that. I, don't, I can't speak yet. I haven't had coffee yet. Nothing makes sense yet. But muscle memory can get me to do this because that's how we start praying. And I know that whatever comes next, not, it'll, be, it'll be messy. It won't be perfect. It'll be, it'll be, I'll fail, I'll fall. But whatever comes next, my orientation, my intent is him. I'm trying. And because everything else, if the catechism is right, everything, everything else comes from him anyway. He's just saying like, okay, just orient towards me. Just look at me. Just, hey, 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 look at me. Everything else is him. I always joke that it, uh, if you've ever seen a little kid who asks his dad to lift him up to, to shoot a basketball, have you seen that? The kid's got the ball is bigger than his head, and the dad picks up the kid and lifts him, and, and then gravity pulls the ball through the hoop, and the dad sets the kid down, and what does the kid say? I did it! I'm like, you're an idiot. You did nothing. Gravity and your dad did everything. But that's the way we feel about things. It's us. No, it's not. Everything else is it's us just saying, hey, will you lift me up? And then God does everything else. And that's prayer. That's relationship with God. Because it is a relationship. And the, the scriptures teach us that a relationship is about the other. The church teaches us to, will, to love is to will the good of the other. And, and, and when it comes to real relationship with God, it's not even how he makes you feel or if he answers what you want him to do in the moment. It's just about him. It's just about him. It's not about how well you pray or how well you don't pray according to you. It's just about him. He just wants to be with you. And to remember, a tagline from tonight is be with him. Not just be. So you've heard people say, like, well, we're human beings, not human doings. We shouldn't do so much. Um, and that's, that's usually said by people who like to not do anything, like me. Like, I'm a laid-back person, so I'm a human being. And my wife likes to do things. And I'm like, honey, you shouldn't be a human doing. But here's the thing. In relationship with God, sometimes it is doing. He wants us to move. He wants us to be on mission. We have a calling when we get up in the morning. It's just that whatever you are doing, if your intent and your orientation is for him, then you can be with him. He is with you in it. When you go to work, when you go to the grocery store, when you go to the gas station, yeah, when you go to Super One, when you go anywhere, you go with him, and it's prayer. You're walking with him in relationship. And that way you can put the worry away. You can put all of your concern and worry away at that point. And I don't know, maybe you're not like me. Maybe you're just like, yeah, I get this. This is old school. But for me to hear these things, I think it bears repeating in our lives to realize that it is about our relationship with him. And in fact, I've heard people say that about, like, it's not about religion and rules. It's about a relationship. That's what I used to say. Like, well, if, you know, especially when I look at the church, Catholicism, I'd be like, oh, there's so many rules and, 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 and whatnot and prayers and things you have to do. It's about a relationship. Yeah, but that's every relationship has all of those things. There are things that I have to do to stay a good husband in relationship with my wife. And there are behaviors that I could do that would break our marriage, that would push us farther away, that would ruin the relationship we had. And it's infinitely more so with God. It is about a relationship, but it's recognizing, okay, if I live my life wanton and I never think of him, I won't be anywhere near him. I will be on my own. I'll be alone. I will not have a relationship with him. But if your orientation and your intent is him, everything else falls into place. The worry can go away. Because if you've ever forgot something, like forgotten, um, like every single time my wife asks me to go to the grocery store, I forget something. It's okay. Every time. The people at Super One in, in International Falls, they know my name. And if I come in fewer than three times, they talk about it. They say, like, why are, where were you yesterday, Nick? And, and that's not a lie. They ask me, like, wow, because my record is six times. I've been in one store six times because my wife will be like, did you get the thing? And I'll be like, I'll be right back again. And, 
and that's fine. Does my, are we not in a relationship anymore? No. Are we still, do we still have a strong marriage? Yes. I'm just dumb. It's fine. She knew that when she married me. And God knew you when he made you. He knew, I don't know, he knew you would be bad at prayer methods. He didn't make you perfect at all the prayer methods. Get over it. It's not even about you. He doesn't care. He just wants your heart. And you can give him your heart in all forms of life. And we have, you know, the famous quote from Therese of Lisieux. I had it written down here. Oh, I can't remember. I had it written down, but this is a famous quote, the one, uh, A Surge of the Heart, because we don't often say the entire uh, quote, and I had it written down. I don't want to forget it, because it is amazing. It just disappeared from my notes. That's hilarious. Um, But anyway, the rest of the the quote is, I mean, I guess I know it. I don't know why I'm doing this, but she starts by saying, it is a surge of the heart. It, It is like a glance toward heaven. But she says that it it is a a look of love that embraces trial and joy. And everybody leaves that part out. Well, it's just a surge of the heart. It's a good feeling. It's not a good feeling. It embraces trial and joy. Because your relationship with him spans your life. And sometimes you have trial. Sometimes life is utterly difficult. Sometimes it it is bone breakingly tough. We know this because we have martyrs. We know this because the day and age we live in right now. And in a little bit, you guys get to do the Stations of the Cross. And as Father was saying, those are the mission of Christ. We know he was in perfect relationship with his Father, and we're gonna, you guys are going to trace what he did tonight. And every step of the way, that was prayer. There were great moments with Jesus when they were hungry and there was food all of a sudden. And there was a blind guy, and then he wasn't anymore. Like, all amazing moments. But when it really came to a head, when it really came to what he was there for, it was the stations of the cross leading to the crucifix. That was him living. In fact, the catechism talks about, I don't have the paragraph here, but it talks about how those last seven words of Jesus on the cross, when he's saying his last words as he's dying, that that is the moment when his prayer and his love and sacrifice are all one. It's the same moment. So when you guys are going through that, often we go through the stations, and you guys are going through Pope Benedict's stations, and they're insanely good. They're, so I won't even go near them. I'll let Father take you through them. They're amazing. But it's easy to start thinking about, like, okay, so this is what Jesus did the whole time. This is all about Jesus. This is what Jesus did. And that is all true. These are the steps along the way to his, his suffering and his passion. That's absolutely true. But he asked us to follow him. He gave us the same mission he had. Brothers and sisters, you have the same mission he has. You have that. There's no way around it. You will not find anywhere in Scripture or the Catechism or the history of Christianity, you will not find a way out of the the Stations of the Cross. They are yours. They are your path. This is your calling every step of the way. From falling down, from being helped by others, from having people around you bear you up, bear your own cross in times of suffering, all this, every, every step of the way, this is you as well. And so when we're praying, if prayer isn't a method, because you know, he wasn't contemplating, he wasn't meditating, he wasn't even vocalizing. Whoa, he, was just doing, he wasn't doing any of the three things. What was he doing? He was living his prayer. He was, this is his mission. This is the ultimate mission. And this is your mission. For our family, this mission looks like packing up and leaving everything and going to Cambodia. And that always looks flashy. It's not. It's the same mission you have. To get up, to trip and fall, to keep our eyes and our orientation toward him, to live relationship with him. And when it gets at its worst is when the most redemption happens. When it is its most difficult is when God is with you in in that trial and joy. And I didn't know that about prayer. I didn't know that that's what prayer was. I thought, well, as I get farther along in the Catholic world, I'm going to be better at meditating. And I might. I might try. I don't know. I'll try in a decade. I'll never contemplate. (laughs) I can be vocal. But when you realize that prayer is this relationship with him, and sometimes it breaks your back, sometimes it raises you from the dead. That is your path. In Virginia, Minnesota, 
That is your mission. To live and die like that. To follow him with joy. To embrace that. When they were choosing uh, how to compile the fourth part of the catechism, when they were choosing to compile the section on prayer, they left the West and they decided to seek out Father Jean Corbon. He's a priest, really well known. He's written some amazing stuff. And they sought him out and asked him, would you, would you compile this? Would you write the church's section on prayer? And he's from the East. He was living in Beirut. He was living in Beirut when it was war-torn. And he wrote this section, what we've been reading tonight. The quotes I was reading to you from the catechism. He wrote those in a bunker while shells were falling. He wrote this amazing, inspiring section on prayer when his life could be over halfway through a sentence. That's, that's when he got this. That's when he realized what prayer was. He's in there in a bunker in the dark with bombs and sirens, and he's writing prayer's relationship. And this is always possible. Can you imagine him sitting there as things fall down around him saying, and this is always possible because I've been baptized. I have the Holy Spirit within me. It is always possible to pray. It is always possible to pray. And that birthed the, ca the catechism on prayer. We can always pray. We do never, ever, ever need to be discouraged again in prayer. There's no place for discouragement in your relationship with Jesus. There's no place for it. You don't need to be discouraged. He wants your heart. He wants your heart when you're angry and cranky and frustrated and distracted. And if he has your heart, you're praying. You're with him. So I encourage you tonight, when we go through the stations, don't just think of it as Jesus. Yes, it is Jesus' path. But because this Lent, we're focusing on mission, on your mission, on your call to reach out. Follow him. Follow him through the stations. He had you in mind when he went through them. So have him in mind when you guys go through them. Be with him in it. And just remember that. If there's anything else to write down, remember, be with him. That's what prayer is. Be with him. With the thrice holy 